An even more significant challenge to the complacent 50s came from America's black community. Living in the consumer society but having few of its advantages, they chose this moment to make white America live up to its ideals. Amazingly, 50s America had moved little beyond the days of Jim Crow. Particularly in the South, life among blacks and whites remained separate and unequal. There was no way you could be black in this country and not be affected by it. Here I was selling millions of records around the world, hero everywhere, and I couldn't get a hot dog in Baltimore unless it went to the back door. It wasn't right, but that's just how it was. That was just life. On December the 1st, 1955, on a public bus in Montgomery, Alabama, life began to change. By refusing to give up her seat to a white man, a tired seamstress named Rosa Parks quietly ignited a revolution. The day that Rosa Parks was arrested, a low murmur went through the whole city. And overnight, this thing bloomed. Led by a charismatic young preacher named Martin Luther King, the city's black community organized a peaceful boycott of the buses. They walked instead. We will do it in an orderly fashion. This is a non-violent protest. We are depending on moral and spiritual forces. White policemen responded by arresting black carpool drivers. White extremists bombed King's home. Martin always said, you know, if you don't have anything that you die for, what do you have to live for? Nobody thought we could stay off the buses. None of those people wanted to lose their jobs. But Martin Luther had instilled in them so rightly that we must all make a sacrifice that the buses continue to run empty. They did for 381 days. On November the 13th, 1956, the Supreme Court ordered the buses desegregated. Martin Luther King was now the undisputed leader of the civil rights movement. The colored population idolized Martin Luther. We are not going back to the buses bragging about a victory. People the experienced the self-esteem that they had never experienced before. Be and they had been given for the last 12 months. a light, a beacon at the end of the tunnel. That light reached Melba Beals, a 15-year-old high school student in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was very conscious of what was going on and wanting it to wash over me and wash over Little Rock. It was about to. In 1954, the Supreme Court had ordered the integration of all public schools in its famous decision, Brown versus the Board of Education. Three years later, that decision would be severely tested at Little Rock's all-white Central High School. Despite the federal court order, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus had no intention of allowing black students to attend Central High, and he ordered the Arkansas National Guard to surround the school. On September the 3rd, Melba Beals and eight other black students walked towards Central High. One, Elizabeth Eckford, became separated from her friends and was surrounded by a white mob that included Ann Thompson. There was just a lot of electricity in the air. It, it was almost a circus-like atmosphere. All these parents on the sideline urging us on and telling us, you know, get out there, don't let them get in. There are uh, mobs on her heels, you know, like dogs nipping at her. The policemen are watching this. Every time she tries to step between them, they close ranks on her. If Central High was to be integrated, it would have to be by order of the president. 
Eisenhower was at first reluctant to interfere. His record on civil rights was not a good one until 1957, the crisis at Little Rock. And there, a fundamental question was dealt with. Do the states have the right to impose their own social order in defiance of federal court orders? Eisenhower answered it decisively, said no. We have made a national commitment. We are going to desegregate this society. And if it takes the 101st Airborne to do it, so be it. It was, I mean, it, that, that is vivid still. You know, I could just see Little Rock just being in a state of siege by the, by the troops, you know. That was real fear. Three weeks after the Little Rock Nine were turned away from Central High, they returned, accompanied by troops of the 101st Airborne. We're all in an Army station wagon, uh, machine gun mounts. It's a pretty heady day. Uh, it's not what uh, everybody gets to go to school. You got a thousand paratroopers, you got helicopters, jeeps in front, jeeps behind. And we stepped out of the jeep into this uh, square of soldiers who were serious. You know, as I walked up the steps that day at Central High School, I can remember the click of the leather boots on those stairs. And I remember being so impressed by who they were. You know, these are Americans. I'm an American. And so the first time I get the feeling that there is hope, that there is a reason I salute the flag, that this is what America is about. I felt that Little Rock would never be the same again. We would never know life as we'd known it again because nine people walked into a school building. My teenage models had been the kids who danced on American Bandstand. And all of a sudden had come the Little Rock Nine. And I can remember having the feeling that they've been, been tied and, and tested and they've survived. Someday, in some way, I'm gonna be tested this way too. Uh, so I think when the movement comes along in the 1960s, I'm ready for it. 